Hello there and welcome to Thursday in Parliament. Whereas the Conservative leadership candidates start to be whittled down, MPs want to know that Parliament won't be suspended to push through a no-deal Brexit. And who can believe that taking back control would mean suspending our democracy? But one peer reckons there's nothing to fear from no deal. Planes will fly, hauliers will operate, Airbus wings will be exported and visa-free travel will continue. Also on this programme, more concerns about the situation in Hong Kong and there's condemnation of the latest violence in Sudan. I think we've all been clear internationally of the completely unacceptable uh, behaviour of the rapid support forces and the uh, absolutely terrible atrocities. But first, three candidates for the Conservative leadership have been knocked out of the contest. At the start of the day, there were ten names on the ballot paper given to MPs and a two-hour voting period for them to make their choice. Boris Johnson, and at just after one o'clock, it was announced that Boris Johnson had secured the most votes, followed by Jeremy Hunt and Michael Gove. Matt Hancock, Sajid Javid, Dominic Raab and Rory Stewart also made the cut, which means Mark Harper, Andrea Leadsom and Esther McVeigh didn't get enough votes to go through to the next round. Well, just ahead of those results coming through, opposition MPs took up some of the comments from the candidates, including one, Dominic Raab, who said he'd prorogue or suspend Parliament to get no deal through. The Sovereign acts on the advice of her ministers. We know that breaching conventions are not illegal. It's a convention, but the courts can look at it, which is why it's so outrageous morally and constitutionally when candidates in the Tory leadership election are suggesting they will put our, put our gracious sovereign in a position to prorogue Parliament. Can he rule that out today? And at least three candidates have said that the UK will leave without a deal, even though Parliament has expressly said and voted against it. Can he rule that out today? The minister said prorogation in the event of no deal was not the government's policy. It is certainly uh, the feeling on this side of the House uh, that uh, Her Majesty the Queen should be kept uh, out of uh, politics. It would be unfair to draw her in to a political situation uh, in that uh, form. Uh, the Honourable Lady made several references to uh, no deal on the various positions of the Conservative uh, candidates, the runners and riders in the uh, forthcoming uh, uh, contest. I don't think it would be right for me to uh, specifically comment on any of those other than to say I think what does unite perhaps the whole House is that a deal is better uh, than having uh, no deal provided we can come together to secure uh, that uh, outcome. Will he at the very least endorse the words of the leadership contender he's supporting uh, this afternoon who said proroguing Parliament in order to try to get no deal through I think would be wrong for many reasons. On this issue of proroguing I have made it very clear uh, that uh, the view of this side of the House of the Government is that this should not be used as a device uh, to ensure that uh, Parliament is absent from the decisions which maybe have to be made towards the end uh, of October and furthermore that it would not be appropriate uh, for Her Majesty the Queen to be drawn into those kind of political decisions. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, I was listening carefully to the response from the Right Honourable General but I'm still hearing them being prepared to uh, suspend our democracy and prorogue Parliament to get this disastrous no deal through. That's the agenda of so many members who are standing for the post of Prime Minister and some of them refuse to rule it out. So we have to hear quite clearly and definitively from the Leader of the House he is not prepared to have our, our democracy suspended. And who can believe that taking back control would mean suspending our democracy and, and suspending this House? when they ranted and raved about mythical, undemocratic Brussels bureaucrats denying us our democracy. We know who the true democracy dem deniers are now. Well, the Honourable Gentleman, of course, as we all know, is one of the most talented musicians uh, in the House, having been in a, a very fine band or two, having even appeared, I believe, on top of the pops, Madam uh, Deputy uh, Speaker. But nonetheless, it is simply not good enough to come to this chamber week after week and play the same old tunes. And of course, in particular, the fact that they are all out, as far as I can tell, out of the ABBA uh, playbook. Whenever he is pressing a minister, it's always money, money, money. When he's pressing his electorate, it's always take a chance on me. <laughs> and once again, he took the opportunity to raise his push for a second referendum. 
But can I just say that if he continues to do that, it will not be long before we hear his version of Waterloo. <laughs> That's about as good as it gets, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm afraid. As to prorogation, he simply referred Pete Wishart to his earlier answer. Well, down the corridor in the Lords, a Conservative former Cabinet Minister said a series of mini-deals with the EU has vastly reduced the likelihood of congestion and delays at ports in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Peter, now Lord Lilly, was asking about the arrangements that have been made for transport, travel and safety. But the Minister said Britain couldn't expect trade to continue with the EU precisely as it does now in the event of a no-deal Brexit. The EU has adopted time-limited regulations covering the aviation market access and safety certificates, as well as road haulage and international rail. The EU has also announced visa-free travel for UK nationals travelling to the UK for short stays after exit. The Government has given reciprocal assurances in each of these four areas, which will provide certainty to businesses and citizens should the UK leave the EU without a deal. Is it not reassuring that these reciprocal mini-deals and many others mean that planes will fly, hauliers will operate, Airbus wings will be exported and visa-free travel will continue. Will my noble friend also confirm that HMRC plan no extra checks at Dover and will prioritise flow over compliance, while France is so determined not to lose trade to Belgian and Dutch ports that they have installed multiple extra lorry lanes at Calais <coughs> located ex inspection points away from the ports and installed equipment to scan moving trains, so the likelihood of congestion and delays has vastly diminished to the obvious disappointment of the Liberal Democrat benches. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the Noble Lord is, is, is right in that the mini-deals do make um, any potential um, exit from the EU without a deal uh, less difficult, um, but they are, as I have already said, um, time-limited, and there will need to be further <coughs> negotiations uh, when, when they expire. What will be the consequences for air and road haulage traffic between the UK and the EU under no deal? If further arrangements beyond the time-limited period are not agreed with the EU, perhaps because we have, for example, declined to pay the £39 billion currently provided for on our departure from the EU. Well, the Noble Lord is quite right that there are uh, multiple mini-deals and they do expire at different times and we will be looking to the EU to extend them and it is within their gift to decide whether or not to extend them as it is within our gift to decide whether or not to reciprocate. And as the Commission itself said that they would only provide for, I quote, basic connectivity and mitigate to some extent the impact of withdrawal without, however, guaranteeing the continuation of all existing air transport services under the same terms as that they are supplied today. And is it not an outrage that some candidates to be our Prime Minister will be receiving votes today by Conservative MPs who would propose to enforce this by suspending Parliament if Parliament does not agree that some of these measures are not in the best interest of our haulage or aviation yeah. sector? Looking at the detail of the deal, it is substantially, it is substantially as uh, it is now, but the Noble Lord is quite right that were these uh, regulations to fall away, which they do on varying dates for various forms of transport, it will be necessary to look very hard what we do thereafter. Does the Noble Lady, the Minister, recall the Government's written answer to me on the 6th of February this year, saying that if we end up trading on normal WTO terms, normal no, no. most favoured nation terms, no, no. EU exporters will pay us some £14 billion per annum, while ours will pay Brussels only some £6 billion per annum. My Lords, might some of that £8 billion annual profit not be useful in subsidising any unforeseen costs on leaving the EU without a deal, with billions to spare no. for other national priorities? Rubble. Total rubble. Unfortunately, I do not recall the Government's response to the Noble Lord of the 6th of February, and certainly uh, discussions of tariffs, tariffs are slightly beyond the scope, the original scope of the question uh, set out today. But we do expect that the EU's most favoured nation tariff regime will apply to the UK if, in the event that the UK leaves the EU without a deal. And Noble Lords will be also very much aware um, that this will result in the introduction of tariffs on 60% of current UK exports to the EU. The uh, Noble Lords um, uh, Lord Lilly said that the um, intention was to prioritise flow 
over compliance, mm -hmm. and I refer to my interest in the register on these matters. Does that really mean that the government is prepared to tolerate unsafe goods, yeah. goods which um, violate intellectual property yeah. laws and everything else coming into this country yeah. simply to facilitate the mantra of no deal? Yeah. Certainly the government will not be tolerating that and that is why we have designed customs and additional control arrangements to make sure that appropriate checks are made. Well, preparations for a no-deal Brexit were preoccupying MPs in the Commons too. A Transport Questions and SNP MP said the government's record to date had been shambolic. In May, the Department for Transport cancelled contracts to provide extra ferry services after Brexit at a cost to the taxpayer of tens of millions of pounds. In February, it axed a £13.8 million contract with a third company, Seabourne Freight, which had no vessels. The government then faced legal action from Eurotunnel and p and ferries over the handling of the contracts. So far, the Secretary of State's reckless actions on ferry contracts alone have cost 43.8 million termination payouts yep. to Brittany Ferries and DFDS, 800,000 on consultancy fees, 33 million pounds to wow. Eurotunnel, with P&O also expecting 33 million plus yeah. legal fees to be added to the final bill. So it will be over 110 million pounds. What is being sacrificed to pay for this, and when will the Secretary of State apologise? Yeah. Yeah. No deal preparation carried out by this department for freight capacity was just 1% of the overall budget for no deal planning. 1%. We've had no apology today, and the Secretary sits there, lets his minister come to the dispatch box while he shakes his head. The, the reality is, the next no deal deadline is October. We're not going to have a new Prime Minister in place till July. Then there's a summer recess, so it's almost impossible to make proper preparations for a no deal Brexit yeah. in October. Yet the Transport Secretary is supporting a no-deal candidate for the leadership of the yep. Tory party. Can the Minister actually detail any work that's ongoing just now? Or is this department so reckless they don't care? There will be further chaos and an hour £110 million pounds down the drain. Yeah. I don't know what to say. They are disappointed that the Secretary of State isn't at the dispatch box, but it is my portfolio and I am pleased to be um, responding to his question. If the Honourable Member was close to the maritime sector, he would be aware that we have been working with them for the last two years. And just this week, we had the interministerial groups with the port sector. I was in front of the APPG for Ports and Maritime. There is extensive dialogue. There is constant um, research done to see what we need to do to continue to prepare. And if it arises again, come October, we'll put preparations in place. Turner. Yeah. You, Mr Speaker, we could be just four months away from a disastrous no deal Brexit and the government has put on hold its contingency plans. His previous efforts resulted in 89 lorries and a refuge truck pretending to be on convoy to Dover, where in reality it takes 10,000 heavy goods vehicles a day. He doled out ferry contracts to ferry companies that didn't have any actual ferries or the means to get them, with the terms and conditions cut and pasted from a fast food takeaway, and he threw 33 million quid away in an out of court settlement, with potentially many more litigations coming down the track. Could the Minister please give us a clue as to the Secretary of State's next great plans? Yeah. Our plans amounted to just 1% of no deal planning and it's the right thing to do for government to prepare for all eventualities and we were responsible in putting together freight capacity which was needed for critical supplies including for the National Health Service. If the Honourable Gentleman is so nervous about no deal he should support a deal. You're watching Thursday in Parliament with me, Alicia McCarthy. Don't forget, you can find any of our programmes by going to the BBC iPlayer and searching for Parliament. And you can follow me on Twitter, at BBC Alicia. Now, MPs from all parties are continuing to voice their concerns over the political situation in Hong Kong, following the worst rioting in decades earlier this week. The protesters are angry about plans to allow extradition to mainland China. 
Despite the widespread opposition, the government has not backed down. Here, the minister turned to comments by Chinese officials about the joint declaration between the UK and China, signed in 1984, that paved the way for the handover of Hong Kong. I note that the Chinese ambassador to London commented on uh, BBC's Newsnight programme last night that the joint declaration is, as he's put it, an historic document that has completed its mission. Once again, I strongly disagree. The joint declaration remains as valid today as it did when it was signed over 35 years ago. That joint declaration is a legally binding international treaty registered with the United Nations. Its objectives clearly apply to both of its signatories, the Government of the People's Republic of China and the UK. It remains in force and it remains acutely irrelevant to the conduct of day-to-day -day life in Hong Kong. We expect China to abide by its obligations. But Labour said this wasn't the first occasion that China had sought to undermine human rights in Hong Kong. It had, they said, been a steady erosion over a number of years. So the big question today, Madam Deputy Speaker, is what is the UK government prepared to do to demand that the Chinese authorities go back to the commitments that they made in the 1984 statement, which, as the Minister of State has said, the Chinese ambassador was saying last night is a historic document. But, you know, they have been saying it for two years. Two years ago, they said it was a historical document which has no practical significance and is not binding. And I agree with the Minister of State when he condemns those comments, but we have to ask, um, is it no wonder that the Chinese are so dismissive of the joint agreement and prepared to commit flagrant breaches of it if we as a country are not prepared to protest when they do so? And let me make it clear, I don't mean this as a personal criticism of the Minister of State, but as a general indictment of the government's approach over recent years, which has not been as clear and robust, and that just the, as, as just set out by the Minister of State. And it is not just me making that indictment. Last year, it was Chris Patton, the former member for Bath, the last British governor of Hong Kong, who described the government's stance towards China as craven. A number of MPs expressed concern about the estimated 300,000 British citizens in Hong Kong. One had a personal story to tell. Yesterday, I had a young Hong Kong woman come to my office and showed me pictures of what had happened to friends of hers who had been protesting in Hong Kong. She showed me the videos of uh, tear gas being used and she showed me the injuries that they had sustained as a result of rubber bullets being used. These things happen because the authorities that employ these methods think that they can do it and get off with it. And she understood, as I think we should all understand, that the Joint Declaration is under attack now, not just from the People's Republic of China, but also by Carrie Lam's administration in Hong Kong itself. And the question, as the Honourable Member from South End said, is what signals do we send? And I have to say to the Minister that the signal that he sends today in saying that the United, Gover the United Kingdom Government does not see the extradition changes as a breach of the Joint Declaration is fundamentally wrong and has to change. Well, Mark Field said that was unfair and the government had simply observed that the proposed new law doesn't automatically breach the letter of the 1984 Joint Declaration. But he said the spirit of that treaty was also important. Now, Labour has claimed that ministers are forcing poor people to choose between paying rent and feeding their families. On Wednesday, the Supreme Court ruled in favour of a single mother who was forced out of her home because of a shortfall in her housing benefit. Birmingham City Council refused to provide her with extra funding and told her to use non-housing benefit to plug the gap. Labour blamed the government for freezing the local housing allowance, which is used to work out how much housing benefit a claimant gets when renting from a private landlord, while private rents were going up. Research by Shelter has found that for a two-bedroom home, even for the cheapest third of rents, LHA rates does not cover rental costs in 97% of areas in England. And in the case the Supreme Court ruled on yesterday, Miss 
Samuels was expected to use her social security to find an additional £150 per month to top up her LHA to cover her rent. This put Ms Samuels in an impossible situation, essentially forcing her to choose between housing herself and feeding her family. The minister explained why the local housing allowance had been frozen. This was about getting our welfare bill under control. It was about ensuring that we provided the support necessary for those who needed it, fairness for those who pay for it, and making sure that our welfare system is sustainable in the long term. Now, what I can commit to the Honourable Lady is that the freeze does end in March 2020, but in all cases we have the targeted affordability, affordability yep. funding available. We also have discretionary housing payments, yep. uh, a billion pounds has been made available since 2011, but ultimately this is also a supply issue. LHA rates is one thing, supply is another. We do need to look at successive governments that frankly have not built enough affordable, and by that I mean council and social housing. The SNP said local authorities were in a very difficult position. There has been a perfect storm that has led so many of us having cases like Ms Samuels at our surgeries. Punitive, arbitrary and punishing cuts to Social Security, including housing benefit, coupled with rent increases and a devastating undersupply in social housing. When will they wake up to the crisis that they are causing? Does the Minister not understand that the Government's commitment to eradicate homelessness will continue to ring very hollow while his department continues to pursue many of the very policies that have created that problem in the first place. We need the welfare system repaired and we need some action to tackle cases like this, record numbers of people using food banks and a welfare system that isn't doing what the Minister states its aim is. Oh, I'm afraid I just don't recognise the picture that the Honourable Lady paints. We are spending records amount on our welfare system, over £95 billion a year for those in working age. Will Quince. Now, Foreign Office Minister has warned that sanctions could be imposed on those who don't play a constructive role in Sudan, moving from military to civilian rule. The army has been in control since long-term President Omar al-Bashir was ousted in April. Pro-democracy protesters are demanding a return to civilian government. Talks broke down after dozens of protesters were killed in a crackdown on a sit-in on June the 3rd. Doctors say 118 people have died in the recent outbreak of violence, but officials put the number at around 60. I think we've all been clear internationally of the completely unacceptable uh, behaviour of the Rapid Support Forces and the uh, absolutely terrible atrocities and we deplore those and we will be making sure that as the international community we are able to both set out the um, potential rewards of moving to civilian rule but also that people understand uh, the potential um, uh, tools that we have um, to, to sanction those who are not playing a constructive role in the transition. The African Union rightly suspended Sudan from its membership until a civilian-led transitional authority is established, but we now need to see further pressure placed on the Transitional Military Council to continue the political transition. And to this end, the government should encourage our allies in Riyadh and Abu Dhabi to persuade Sudanese paramilitary forces to pull out of Khartoum and resume negotiations with protesters. In the last 10 days, at least 124 people have been killed by the regime forces and more than 700 have been injured as protests have steadily engulfed Khartoum. We've also had widespread reports of sexual violence, mass arrests, gunfire and medical facilities <laughs> and bodies floating in the River Nile. The SNP follows the EU in calling for the Sudanese government to release all journalists, members of the opposition, human yeah, rights yeah. defenders and other protesters arbitra arbitrarily detained and to conduct a thorough investigation into recent deaths and human rights abuses. The critical point that Britain can make at this time is that there will be no impunity for the human rights abusers in the regime in Sudan who are conducting a most appalling uh, events in Sudan, in Khartoum and elsewhere in respect of civil society which is trying to move Sudan 
to a better place. And it's not just the appalling events that have taken place through the militias and the Janjaweed in Darfur, where uh, President George Bush referred to events there as a, a genocide and where General Bashir must be held to account by the International Criminal Court. It is also that the human rights abusers in the forces in Khartoum can be held to account today through mobile phone technology. There are many pictures of individual people who have been abusing the human rights of citizens in Khartoum. And Britain should make the point that they will all be held to account, no matter how long it takes, in due course. And that's it from me for now. But do join me on BBC Parliament on Friday night at 11 for the week in Parliament. I'll look back at the last few days here at Westminster. I'll be rounding up the week and talking to two experts about whether it's possible to prorogue Parliament to deliver a no-deal Brexit. But for now, from me, Alicia McCarthy, goodbye. Hello. As the flooding and disruption continues, particularly across parts of England, some spots have had three months' worth of June rainfall in just a week, over 150 millimetres in the wettest places. Now, it's still rain in the forecast, but not necessarily the same areas as low pressure adopts a new position to the northwest of the UK in the coming days. I mean, showers are most frequent in the north and west, and there is, as Friday starts, a fresh area of rain affecting parts of England and Wales. Also, rain in northwest Scotland, fairly chilly for the clearer parts of Scotland and. Northern Ireland as the day begins. But where you start the day with rain, things should improve as we go through the day. It should brighten up and it'll be an afternoon of sunshine and showers. Here's a look at things at eight o'clock in the morning. So you're in the rain in northwest Scotland, especially into the West Niles. One or two showers elsewhere, but where you have got the clear skies and here into Northern Ireland too, your temperature could be around the mid single figures as the day first starts. But you can see the outbreaks of rain from Northern England, the Midlands into Wales, perhaps affecting parts of southwest England, perhaps the odd showery burst towards the southeast. But the further southeast you are, may well be seeing some sunshine as the day begins. So on through the day, then you can pick out the two areas of rainfall, but they're slowly easing and things start to brighten up more widely. So by the afternoon, it is sunshine. Showers may be heavy and thundery, very few for East Anglia and South East England, perhaps up to 20 Celsius here. For most of us, it'll feel a bit warmer, especially where you've had days stuck in the rain. Now, going through Friday evening, we'll see another, another area of rain, this time pushing into Northern Ireland and then feeding on towards southwest Scotland, Wales and Western England as Saturday starts. Ahead of that, it'll be mainly clear bar the odd shower. So that takes us on to the weekend. The big picture has low pressure here to the northwest of us. So it will be feeding in weather disturbances from the west this time. And this is the first one we're contending with on Saturday morning. So it will be an area of cloud, some showery rain out of that slow slowly moving further east as the day goes on. Ahead of it, sunny spells, maybe a shower. Behind it, sunny spells and the chance of catching a shower. On a fairly breezy day with temperatures topping out in the mid to high teens. Now, part two of the weekend on Sunday, if anything, looks a little bit breezier. And it will be another day of sunshine and showers. Now, the showers most frequent in the north and west, where again, they could be heavy and possibly thundery. Some, though, will push a little bit further east on the breeze during the day. Showers, not every Everybody will catch one, and again, temperatures mostly in the mid to high teens. That's the latest forecast. I'll see you soon.